Hi, everyone. My name is Dave Fredrickson. I'm the executive vice president of AstraZeneca and the lead of our oncology business unit. It is really my pleasure to welcome uh, three panelists uh, to have a conversation uh, really in honor of Lung Cancer Awareness Month. We're here today because, as we well know, globally, lung cancer is still the most commonly type of diagnosed cancer, and it's the leading cause of cancer death worldwide. And what we would really like to do today, as we've done in the last couple of sessions, is spend some time exploring the impact that the pandemic has had on diagnosis, screening, testing within lung cancer. But we would also then like to take a moment to think about the future and what some of the new innovations are uh, that are coming into lung cancer and what some of the work is that we need to do uh, collectively across uh, the ecosystem in order to make sure that these innovations make it to patients as quickly as possible. So with that, I want to turn to my first theme, which is to really take a look at the impact of COVID-19. Maybe, Dr. Baird, I'd, I'd, I'd first like to come to you. From the work that you're doing with the patient advocacy community and the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, can you just talk about some of the key challenges that patients are facing right now in the context of the pandemic? One of the huge issues, and I think everybody impacted by this uh, pandemic is finding, is that there is a bit of a sense of isolation because, you know, you can't go to maybe your normal support group you'd go to for your peer-to-peer -peer support or um, in-person support, and that's very isolating for the lung community. For those who might be at risk of lung cancers, there's a whole host of other issues you know, there's really in a lot of countries a lack of clear communication as to what services are open. So people are sitting at home, you know, they might have um, a new cough, they might have a persistent cough, they might have a new pain, they might have increased breathlessness, but they're unsure where they can go or who they can contact. Dr. Stiles, I'd be interested in getting your perspective just from within your institution. Can you comment a little bit about any uh, changes, evolutions that you've gone through um, in order to really make sure that you're addressing um, some of the, the, the realities of the pandemic that we're facing. Patients are just scared and it's incredibly challenging because the respiratory symptoms of COVID obviously overlap a lot of the respiratory symptoms of lung cancer and that has so many negative effects on both diseases, both in terms of diagnosis and treatment. We and a lot of other institutions have really worked hard to try to extend telemedicine I think as Anne-Marie had said, the, the key is really communication. That's obviously really challenging in this environment with limited resources and with patients afraid to come see us, um, you know, decreased visit times, having to space out patient visits. But it's a really challenging time. We too have seen our numbers of lung cancer diagnoses go down. We know that that doesn't mean that lung cancer has gone away. We're certainly worried that we're gonna see patients who present at a more advanced stage. We're working hard to try to understand that right now. Dr. Herbst, I'd, I'd love to get your perspective. What are some of the things that we're seeing right now in terms of the latest innovations to being able to really make sure that we're having good early detection practices? Well, we, we've made such advances, you know, in, in the last 15, 20 years in prevention of lung cancer. And of course, there's primary prevention, you know, working on smoking cessation. But for those who have smoked, you know, lung cancer screening has become a standard of care. I have seen screening go down, and that's a shame because finding a lung cancer at a stage one, two, or even three makes a big difference than if it's in an advanced stage four. Even there, we have many many better therapies today, but the best way to treat lung cancer is to get it early or to prevent it uh, altogether. Dr. Stiles, when it comes to early diagnosis um, and early screening and detection, are there things from a, from a healthcare system perspective or from a policy perspective that you think are particularly relevant and important um, for us to be focused on. As you know, and the panelists know, lung cancer really has long been plagued by both stigma and nihilism. Um, I believe that we need to take a systematic approach to take some critical decision-making factors out of individual practitioners' hands. Um, and these practitioners may have unconscious biases um, for patients with lung cancer, but they just might simply not be up to speed on all the incredible advances that, that Roy talked about. Um, but we can take systematic institutional approaches to identify eligible patients for screening, um, to perform reflex biomarker testing, and to ensure that there's standardized care across the institution through the biomarker that's tested. But that does take a little bit of buy-in from the systems. It sometimes takes a little bit of an investment in it. 
But um, that's really the way to overcome disparities and to overcome sort of piecemeal screening, piecemeal biomarker testing. Dr. Barrett, I'd be curious to know, do you, have you seen an evolution um, among the lung cancer patient community in terms of either the degree of involvement or activism as we've seen advancements in new technologies and therapies. I think we're not at a point where we can pat ourselves on the back and say job well done here because, you know, it, there's still a lot of issues around stigma and nihilism. It, it hasn't gone away. You know, in some parts it might have Im improved, but it's still something that's very commonly experienced by people impacted by this disease. I know personally for me, I've had a grandmother and an aunt die from small cell lung cancer. And the stigma we experienced as, as a family was unbelievable. When you're given a diagnosis, particularly a lung cancer diagnosis, there's a lot to process there. And because of the images and the statistics that you see around the disease, it, it, it just increases the fear, the worry, the stress. And, um, you know, I think stigma has a huge role that it's playing on the psychosocial impact of this disease. Dr. Herbst, um, Dr. Baird speaks about um, the importance of new innovations and new treatments. What are some of the innovations on the horizon that you're most enthusiastic about as you look towards that as it relates to care? We're not done until we can help every patient. We're doing a lot better. It's just actually amazing. But still, we, we have to look and personalize this and find the right drugs for every patient. You know, over these 25 years, we've seen the advent of targeted therapy, you know, drugs that uh, are designed to work against specific abnormalities and cancers, basically like a lock and a key. I have some patients who uh, 20 years ago would have had a very bleak prognosis who are doing great now, 10 years later, but I won't be done, and I'm sure my colleagues feel the same, until we have something for everyone. Dr. Stiles, I'd be interested in your perspective on the exact same question that Dr. Herbst uh, just had an opportunity to respond to. Well, I agree with everything Roy said, and I do think as we look back on this time that lung cancer will go down as one of the greatest success stories of any disease, really. I used to, even in my relatively younger career, I used to give the medical students a lecture, and I would get to stage four on lung, on lung cancer and say, chemotherapy consider targeted therapy when I first started. And, and now I have to show a slide that somebody made that shows seven different pathways on the targeted therapy side and several on the immunotherapy side. It's stunning to see the progress and it really is inspiring, I think, to our lung cancer patients. Perhaps that's a good place for us to kind of wrap up. And I'd like to go uh, around to each of you and just ask in a sentence or two, if you could talk about what excites you the most as you turn towards the future in terms of where we're going in the treatment of lung cancer? Really, I would like to see more research and I would like to see people thinking about it as a complete pathway so that these innovations, the research that's been undertaking really gets into the clinical setting as soon as possible and gets to everybody that needs it, not just the select few. I really dream of a world of personalized therapy for early stage lung cancer patients. We, we know that we can cure a lot of these patients, not just extend their life. All the advances that Roy and other oncologists and pharma has made in the advanced stage, I really am excited about seeing those translated to early stage patients and personalized care of early stage patients, whether it's limited resection up front, stereotactic radiation, or adding in targeted therapies, we can still do better with early stage disease. Well, I love the collaboration we have right now, the public-private partnerships, academia, the community, industry, government, all working together uh, to bring the best therapies to bear for patients. The immune therapy, it's a phenomenal advance. The fact that we see 15, 20% of patients who had the most advanced lung cancer doing great is just gives hope to everyone, including myself. It gets me excited every day to work. As we come to the end of Lung Cancer Awareness Month, I want to acknowledge and thank everybody within the oncology community, the lung cancer community, for all of the efforts that have been made. Uh, we know that even though we might be merging into a new normal, that it is, in fact, the same cancer, and it's important that we continue to treat it with that vigilance. So with that, I'd like to thank the three of you for joining me here today, and, and, and very, very uh, best of luck and stay safe.